Okay, the recording started, and we're going to go ahead and get cracking here. Okay, the short passages. Last time we talked about long passages. Who remembers some things that we typed about long passages last time? In the text box, go ahead and type some things that we told you about long passages. See what you guys come up with in the text box. Anybody? Some of the lessons about long passages. Okay, background info. Other people. Point. Okay, so point means we'll, we'll flesh these out a little bit. Structure, logic, point, tone. Yeah, those are good. Okay. And then we talked about two focus questions, which we're definitely going to hang on to those. So, yes, excellent. And then anybody else? Anything else that we talked about last time? We're going to condense some of these into a summary here in a little bit. I see a couple of people are still typing. Yeah, what the facts do, the point is never just to inform, right? Okay, that's a pretty good summary. So let's go ahead and get that summary on the board. And then we'll see which of these things apply and which of them don't apply in terms of the longer passages. Because unfortunately, some of them will be true and others will not. So, things we learned about long passages last time. The first thing is that there's a regular structure. There's a very regular structure to the long passages. Where you've got the first paragraph is a genuine intro paragraph, which almost always summarizes the main idea pretty cleanly. And then the body paragraphs have also their own type of structure, which is basically you have a topic sentence. And then the rest is a bunch of details, which are less important, and they usually just support the topic. And then in terms of how to read it, you don't really have to concentrate on the whole thing. It's OK to read selectively, and even to skip parts. We talked about how the main intro paragraph is very important. And we also talked about how the topic sentences are important. And then if there's a change of pace, if there's a focus shift or wrap up at the end, then that's important. And then lastly, let me flip through some of the other things you guys are saying. What's going on with the sound feedback? Um, is anybody else having issues with the sound? If you want to go ahead and type in the box. Issues with the sound. Um, yeah, I'm. I am working on a. I am working on a netbook that has a keyboard that's very close to the microphone. So, what's going to wind up happening when I type things is you will hear. Uh, you'll hear some noise because unfortunately it's a very small travel netbook and everything is kind of close to everything else. So, I will do my best. Um, to minimize the feedback issues, but we'll we'll, we'll have to deal with it when it comes to that. So, but is anybody having issues hearing me? If you are, tell me in the text box. If it's a little bit of interference from the keyboard, then we'll unfortunately have to just handle that. Okay. So, um, 
for those of you who don't have sound, I don't really know what the deal is. But some of you are having good sound. Okay, and then when we talk about how to read it or what to read for, there's two focus questions that we talked about last time. The first focus question was, what's the point? Like, why are they telling us this stuff? Why is this here? What's the purpose? What is the author trying to achieve? The second focus question is, if there are details or facts. And it's not so much if, it's an issue of when. Not if there are details or facts, but when there are details or facts. Why are the facts here? What do they do? And it's almost like a critical reasoning. Like, how do they address any claims that are present or implied? You know, because there should be some sort of element of an argument here. You know, it's, it's as Andres pointed out, we're not just going to be listing a bunch of facts for your viewing pleasure. I mean, if there are a bunch of facts, they will be intended to make some sort of point. So you've got to figure out what that point is. And in a couple of passages that we're going to see, the way that it fits together is, is actually pretty much dependent on folks' questions, number one and two. All right, now let's talk about, do these apply to the short passages? So, how much of this, how much of this advice still applies to the short passages? Does anybody know? Of the stuff on this screen, how much of this stuff still applies to the shorter passages? I'm going to type in the text box. Which things do you think apply? Which things do you think don't apply? Right. To people who are saying most or something like that, try to be specific. If you think all of it still applies, then, then you don't need to clarify that. But if you think there are some parts that don't apply and some parts that do, try to clarify that as well. We're starting to get in on it here. We're starting to zero in on it a little bit. It's not all of it. So for those of you who are saying all of it, it's not all of it. Yeah, you can't skip things anymore, and it's no longer a regular structure. So those of you who are basically saying that, you are correct. So the, the stuff about the structure facts about the structure of the passage are no longer true. And the thing that's unfortunate about short passages is that short passages don't have a regular structure. There's, no, there's nothing you can say about the way that they're constructed that's going to be true in general without very frequent exception. So I mean, there are some things that are quite often true of short passages, but there's nothing that you can really say that is true all the time. So, for instance, um, normally, but not always, there's some sort of topic sentence at the beginning, but not always. And we'll see a passage today on which there's not one. Um, normally, in fact, I won't even say normally. I'll say many times. Because normally seems like more than half the time, and I don't even know if I could say that with much confidence. But many times there's some sort of topic sentence. Again, um, many times there will be 
transition word, such as however, or but, or also, or furthermore, or any of those kinds of transition words, any of those words that indicate logic. But not always. Etc. So what this means, since short passages don't have, yeah, also is a transition word because, I mean, transition words don't have to mean things are changing. Transition words are anything that shows you how two or more sentences fit together. Like if you say also, then you're having two things that are like each other or that make the same point. Whereas if you had however or but, that means you're going to be making the opposite point. So yeah, that, that's, a, that's a kind of transition word. The transition words are anything that, I don't know if they're universally called that, but when I taught school, I called them that. And I, they were called that when I was in school. Transition words, basically words that indicate logic. But the fact that there's a, ra that there's a lack of regular structure, means that you can't skip parts of the passage anymore. So you can no longer bet on certain parts of the passage being more or less important than other parts of the passage. Um, whoever's messing with the board, please don't. In fact, let me just disable that. Okay. You can no longer rely on the importance of certain places in the passage. Instead, you actually have to go through the whole thing. So the process is much less of a process, but the process is basically this. You do actually have to proceed through the whole passage. But, and this is even more important now because you can't isolate any location to concentrate on more. It's even more important that you focus exclusively on those two focus questions. So, concentrate exclusively on the two focus questions. If you remember what those are, the two focus questions are what's the point, and if there are details, what are they doing there? So let's get this stuff upstairs so that we can get the focus questions to fit on the screen. My cut and paste is not working, so let's just retype the focus question. The first focus question is what's the point? Or what is the author trying to argue? Argument is a good word to is a good word to use here because these things really do have to be argument. Like the author actually has to be trying to make some point or another. Like if you this is a good word to use because if you think the passage is just throwing a bunch of facts at you, then you won't be able to answer this question because throwing a bunch of facts at you is not an argument. So for people who fall into the bad habit of thinking the passages are just collections of facts, one thing that will help you a lot is to use this word when you think about this focus question. You think about what is the author's argument, what, what point is trying to be made. And then the other point is not to get swallowed up in facts when there are facts or details. Why are they there? How, what arguments are supported or refuted by these facts or details? 
In other words, you're not supposed to really remember what the facts were because you don't, at the end of the day, you don't really care. But you do care what those are doing as far as the way they affect the argument go. So this may be a little bit less than satisfactory for a lot of people who are looking for a formula. But basically, we're here to tell you that there's not a formula, unfortunately, for this stuff. It's just not formula A. So the trade-off is you have less of a passage to deal with. You have you have a lot fewer words in the passage. But the trade-off for having a passage that has fewer words is that it's much more random and there's a lot less reliability to the way that it's structured. Smiley face if this all makes sense. Any questions, go ahead and type them in the text box, please. Otherwise, we'll start looking at some actual passages and making some sense of them. Okay. I don't see anybody typing, so I think we will go ahead and start looking at a passage. In particular, let's look at this one first. So. Okay, um, this is important if you can't see this passage or if it's distorted on your screen, let me know. This passage appears in a text box and on Illuminate, text boxes are sometimes different sizes and they appear differently on different people's screens. So if a text box is, is not legible to you, then let me know. In other words, you should see a passage on the screen. It's basically one giant paragraph, yes. Um, in fact, yeah, th this one is actually really just one giant paragraph. Um, some of these have paragraph breaks. This one doesn't. Um, as far as the person who's asking about the level of the questions, it, it's really not something that's ever worth worrying about. Um, with reading comp, there's no real distinction between questions that would be considered easier and questions that would be considered harder. The techniques that are used to answer them are not any different. So if a question is harder, it's only because maybe people have a little bit of a more difficult time finding the information. But the techniques are the same. So what we're doing today is applicable across the board. OK, um, remember what our focus questions are. So let's read through this and let's talk about what they're doing here. And remember what you want to do in order to find the point. One of the best ways to find what they're doing, what are they arguing, is to look for transitions. To find the argument, one of the best ways to find the argument is to look for logical transitions. So here are some logical transitions that are in this passage as we read through it. Um, if they say traditional, why do you think they would do that? Like, not all transitions are words like however or furthermore or anything like that. Um, some transitions are things like traditional or people have said. So, um, okay, you guys are starting to get it. Text box, anybody has any other ideas? Argue against it, maybe, maybe not. Um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. But yeah, it's a contrast of some sort. Yeah, I argue against is maybe a little bit too specific. But yeah, they're, they're, they're gonna, there's going to be a new view. So if they see traditional indicates that some sort of contrast is going to come up. Because otherwise there'd be no reason to say that. So either a new view 
or counter. So good. Um, my, yeah, so that's basically what you guys are saying. So traditional social science models of class groups in the U.S. are blah, 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 blah. So let's talk about the notes we would take. Remember the notes which are exclusively to answer the focus question. So to answer what's the point and also to answer why are the facts here. So it's definitely worth writing down. It first presents the traditional model of class three. They, they are blah, 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 fact, 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 fact. The reason why these facts are here is just to describe what the traditional view is. So you don't so much care right now. You don't want to write it down. Um, here's a contrast. Some of these people, by contrast, have argued that it is instead based on. So you can pick up from this, this is going to be important. So this is a transition. So notice some people by contrast and instead. So there's your new view. So the feminist model says it's instead based on gender, which means that this must not have been based on gender, even if you didn't pick that up. You can figure it out from the transition. So feminist said, said it's based on gender. And this was new. This is a new idea. This is not the transition idea. So traditional model, new idea, we're starting to see a structure emerging here right in front of our eyes. Traditional model, new idea. Social historian Mary Ryan, for example, someone tell me what to do with that while you are reading this passage the first time. Good. Yeah, you can just skip it, or at least let your eyes kind of glaze over it, because it's just an example. It, it, it's an example. So um, you can say, for example, exactly what it means. These words are just going to be details supporting the new view. So you don't really care about them right now, but if they ask you a question about it, then you're going to care. Otherwise, you're not pretty much black and white. Um, same thing with a colon, same sort of thing. Um, colon also usually also means details to follow. So that colon is also a transition showing you that they're going to come up with examples. So blah, 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 blah. We don't care. We'll come back to it if we need to. Recently, though, recently is also a transition because it contrasts with traditional. Other feminist analysts have questioned this model. So notice there's just loads of transitions there. We've got recently, we have a though, and we have a question this model. So that means we're going to get another new view. So we can get into the details of it later if we need to, but we can just say other feminists 
came up with yet another model. And then blah 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 facts. For example, so more stuff that we don't so much care about right now. And then we're done. Any questions? Does this model point to the contrast? Well, question this model does. Not this model by itself, but if you're questioning the model, then that means there's a contrast. Let me know if that makes sense. Um, does the author take sides? The author does not take sides. I mean, you can tell that when you see this kind of stuff, it's just these people said this, these people by contrast said this. For example, this person said this, this, these people said this instead. So the author here is clearly not taking sides. Um, other questions that you guys have? Yeah, so Gaurav, you're right, there's no sides being taken here. Um, it depends. The question is, do we have to read through the details or skip them? I mean, the words after, for example, I wouldn't bother with. At least not right now. If you have to answer a question about them, then that's different. But the issue with concentrating on those words is that they will throw you off of the things that matter as far as the main idea goes. Because the, the, the examples are examples. Like, as far as the main idea is concerned, they just don't really matter. So, because they're examples. So, they, they illustrate the ideas, but they don't tell you what it is. Um, as far as the tone, you, you will never have to come up with a word for the tone. Um, I know that some of our old exams did ask for, like, what is the tone of this passage. The GMAT, as far as we've seen, has never actually done that. So you're not going to have to come up with a word for the tone. But sometimes they'll ask questions like, you know, the way this is written suggests that it's aimed at what kind of people. So you, you might have to think about the way it's written in order to answer those kinds of questions. But you're not going to have to specifically say what is the tone. Especially not of a passage like this one, because this passage is just totally neutral and it, it's just an analysis. So. There's nothing interesting about the writing of this passage. It's not it's not ambivalent. Ambivalent means I mean again, I don't want to spend too much time talking about this because you will not be asked to do that. Again, you I, I, I promise you you will not be asked to name the tone of the passage. It will not happen. But ambivalent means you actually have feelings both ways about something. Like ambivalent means there are things that you think are good and things that you think are bad, or you approve and you disapprove. Yeah, it's like you go back and forth on it. So that, that's not true. It's like ambivalent means you have to have two opinions that are in conflict. This author has no opinions at all. So it's not that. It, it's totally analytical. Anyway, this is really the only notes you, you would have to be taking. So that's about it. So these are just about all the notes you would need to take. It's not a lot of notes, but it's really all you need. Okay. Who remembers what we said about answering main idea questions? Text box. How do you answer the main idea question? There you go. Namit's got it. Namit, everybody look at what uh, Namit point Joshi at point NCSU wrote. 
Yeah, remember you want to actually, you can't close them, but you should be able to cover them up, physically speaking. So, yeah. So, remember what we said about the question type still applies. So, everything we said about how to answer question types is still going to apply. So with main idea questions, just to give a the reason why you want to do this is in the last study hall archive if you if you're interested in the reason. But the technique for main idea questions is you actually, as weird as this sounds, you actually want to physically cover up the answer choices. Then you want to predict the answer from your reading and notes. The focus question should be more than enough to help you predict the answer. And then compare your prediction with the choices. Do not look at the choices until you have predicted. Do not. Very important. We talked about this last time, but the way that they get you to get main idea questions wrong is to give you choices that are totally wrong, but which are still tempting if you have been, you know, if, if, it's like the way salesmen convince you that you want things that you don't really want. Because if you don't walk in there with your mind made up, then they can put ideas in your head that were not really there. So. So remember what we've got, here's a main idea question, and conveniently, I've covered the choices. You should not see the answer choices right now. Smiley face if the answer choices are not there. Give me the smiley face, okay. Smiley face. All right. Um, For the person with a raised hand, if I don't know if you meant to click that or not, if you did. Then, um, if you didn't, if you didn't mean to click that, don't worry about it. If you did, if you have a question, please type the question in the text box. Okay. Remember, here are the notes. The notes that we have are here. So. Everybody take about 15 or 20 seconds to come up in your head with a primary purpose. Please don't write it down because we have 54 other people watching and there will be hundreds of others too watching the archive. But in your head, come up with an answer to this. And then in a little bit, I'll reveal the choices. Okay, does anybody need more time for that? If you need more time, tell me in the text box, please. Okay, nobody needs more time. Here's your answer choices. Let me get rid of the notes right down there. And what I'm going to give you to work with here, please please don't type answers into the text box. What I'm going to give you in about five seconds is um, answer choices. You should see right now appearing A through E multiple choices. They should have just appeared right there. Please click one of those. Yeah, we did. Okay. 
Okay, about half of you still haven't picked one yet. Okay, try to pick an answer, please, in the next 15, 10 seconds. Okay, three seconds. Okay, here's your statistics. Move them out of the way. All right. So you guys definitely picked this correctly. It's C. If you look at this, again, if you're making a prediction here, it should be pretty clear that it that that's what's going on. Like if you, here's our notes that we had. Remember, all you had to write down was this. Someone gave the traditional model of class groups. Feminists gave some other model of the same thing. And then other people gave yet another model of the same thing. So the point of the passage is just to is just to contrast three different models of, of these class groups. So if you look at the choices that we've got, this one says this, just to consider different views held by them, to contrast them with each other. That's pretty much exactly what that is. The other ones don't really come too close. So does anybody have any questions about, and notice the overwhelming performance of the people who predicted the choices. Definitely effective strategy. So um, as far as that question goes, as far as social scientists, um, if people are analyzing class groups, that pretty much makes them a social scientist. It's kind of like if someone is doing physics experiments, then you can call them a scientist, even if it doesn't say that. But it does here, notice, it does actually say social scientist here. And then these are social science models, which implies that they're also held by social scientists. Um, so lastly, though, analysts, analysts who are analyzing this stuff are also, you can call them social scientists. Um, as far as D goes, D is not the point. Um, the point is to give the traditional model and then to give other models that contrast with it. But this passage is not advocating any particular model. It's just giving you the different models for, so that you can compare them and, and contrast them. So if you said D, D means you're just, D means to propose this is actually to, number one, that would be advocating these views, which this passage doesn't do. Um, this passage just says these people thought this, but they don't propose it or they don't advocate it. Um, Secondly, you're ignoring the first half of the passage, the first quarter of the passage, where they talk about the traditional models. Like, D completely ignores the fact that the passage gives traditional models and then gives other models that conflict with that. Um, B is not the point. Um, B is, if you look at these notes here, it has nothing to do with B at all. Um, B just talks about here's different ways people model class groups. So that's the point. If you if you considered B even for a short if you considered B even for a short bit, this means that you got caught up in detail. And in fact, if you pick B, you made two mistakes. Which are the following? If you pick this. You made two mistakes, which are number one, you got caught up in the details.
because all of the economic role stuff in this passage is detailed, all of it. And then also, you didn't predict the answer. Or at least you didn't stick to your prediction. Because if you had come up with an answer ahead of time, you, you definitely would not have come up with something like B. So, because, like, a couple of the random details in this passage have to do with, with economic roles, but not much else. So, um, can anybody else not see the text that I wrote? Text box, tell me. There should be some blue words next to choice B. Do you guys see them? It's on top of the choices. Um, Hmm. Let me move it down to the bottom. Let's put it down here. If you pick B, which was the only choice that lots of people picked that was wrong, then you made both of these two mistakes. Think carefully about that. Number one, you got caught up in tons of details. And number two, you, you probably almost certainly did not heed the advice to come up with your answer first. Because again, this is how these things work. This is how main idea questions work. I mean, th they'll have stuff that, that is sort of tangentially related, but then, you know, you'll be like, if you're just picking through the choices, they'll be like, oh, I saw that. You know, it'll be tempting. I mean, they do talk about economic roles, but that's totally not the main point. And if someone, if you predicted the main point, you would not come up with that. Any other questions about this problem? I see a couple of people with Alexia has text in his spot. Um, I Alexia, I'm not sure what you're asking me, so maybe if you could retype that as a as a complete sentence. Um, I, I don't really know what you're asking me. Sorry. Um, notice we've got a rehash of the main idea advice. Now we're going to start looking at new types of questions, but this is what we do as main idea questions. Um, Alexi, if you're asking me whether examine and analyze are the same thing, the answer to that is pretty much yeah, they are. So if that's what you mean, then, then the answer is yes. Okay, any other questions about main idea questions? Now we'll start looking at some new types of questions. Okay, let's look at other types of questions that take the same type of approach. Um, again, yeah. It, Every, everything about question types is exactly the same. So, everything, not just main ideas. The only thing that's different is the way that you read and analyze and focus on them. But all of the advice about how to answer specific question types is the same. is the same for short as for long answer. None of it's going to be any different. So whatever we say, because remember last time the only question type we got to was main idea. But all of the other advice um, that we're going to give today is also retroactively applies to the, to the longer passes as well. Um, generally, the short passages fit on the screen when you take the GMAT prep, and the long passages don't. That's the best way to think about it. Um, on our exams, on the MGMAT exams, none of the passages fit into the window. You have to scroll over all of them. But in the GMAT prep software. The, I mean, you'll know if you take more than a couple of practice tests, you will you will definitely know the difference. Like, 
the long passages are a lot longer than the short passages, and if you take a couple of practice tests, you will you will totally know. Um, the main idea question is going to depend on every word in the, in the choices. I mean, the words have to be accurate. But again, you're you're the way you're asking that question makes it sound like you're trying to memorize things. And I will tell you, you will not be able to memorize anything that will help you answer main idea questions. It's not going to happen. Like, main idea questions, you, you have to answer by thinking about these focus questions and then by predicting the answer in your head, the focus questions that we talked about, which are these. There's nothing you can memorize that will help you with main idea questions. It's, it's, it's not possible. So, um, no, you should do this reading first, and this is focus focus based reading. You should do this first before you answer the question. Because if you read the question before you do anything, then you're going to wind up reading the passage again every time you have a question, which is not going to be time efficient. Um, but yeah, and if there, I mean, if there is anybody out there watching this recording who, I mean, there's a spectrum of of learning types um, where, okay, um, the best way for me to indicate this is to kind of use a number of line type presentation. But there's there's a spectrum of the spectrum of the way people learn. Where generally it varies from pure memorization to pure understanding and intuition. Um, most people are kind of in the middle, but you know, it, a lot of people like to memorize things more than they like to think about them. And a lot of people like to think more than they like to memorize, you know, where the extreme types are, you know, over here you've got people who just memorize stuff and don't use intuition at all. Um, in other words, where total nonsense would seem just as logical as things that make sense, because people who are this far over here don't even think about whether things make sense or not. Um, this end is people who just don't memorize any fact at all, just kind of you know, use their gut feelings and stuff for, for everything. Um, most people are in the middle. You, you definitely want to have, you definitely want to have a, a balance of these two. But if you are over here, if you are extreme on this side of the spectrum, like, if you are, this is not going to be very many people, but if you are extremely far to the left on this spectrum, I'll fix that type out in a second, um, you may want to consider not reading through the passage at all. Um, just randomly guessing on main idea questions. And then spending most of your time on the on the detail based questions. Such as inferences and facts like I mean, because if if the problem with main idea questions is that main idea questions are pure intuition. Like memorization just can't help. So this is not going to be most people, but some people have put questions to us that are like, what can I memorize that will help me find the main idea? And the answer is nothing. Nothing. You cannot memorize anything in terms of main ideas. So if you are one of the people asking those questions, um, you may not even want to bother with the main idea questions. You know, like if, if you are very far over to this side, it's, a, it's an acceptable sacrifice. And it will let you have more time to do the questions. Because then if you, the, 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 up, the flip side of that is if you're one of those people, you'll be very, very good at these questions. 
um, or at, at the questions that require you, not these, at the questions that do require you to do peer memorization, which will, you know, will come to so. Okay. Um, so the person typing questions with three question marks at the end, um, have patience, please. Um, this is a, hundreds of people are going to watch this, so we want to make sure that, that everybody gets what they need to get. Okay, let's look at other questions. Okay, um, there are other types of questions that have the same strategy as the main idea. In other words, there are also going to be other types for which I didn't have. Okay, there are going to be other types for which the strategy is also cover up the choices and predict. And let me tell you what those are. Okay, if you get like what or like how is the passage structured? Or if you get what does the author need or intend by the use of the word? You know, they point out some word. Or if they say something like, how does the first paragraph um, contrast with the second paragraph? Or like, what's the best description of, you know, something like this paragraph? or relationship, et cetera, or the tone or attitude of the passage suggests that what, or, or like the tone or attitude of the passage um, suggests that the author feels how about this issue. I mean, notice what all of these have in common. Primary purpose is this. And then also, if there's a question that asks you to make a title for the passage, that's also this. Because if you're making a title, that's the, the title is definitely going to be the main idea. So um, we should try to stay focused on RC here. Um, Blake, there's a whole study hall on those bold faced questions. It's, it's, I want to say, it's either April 1st or April 15th. So, if you want to just go watch the archives, then that's in there. Um, basically, all these questions have in common the idea that um, basically any question that asks you for the, the meaning intent or organization, organizing principle. You still want to cover up the choices, predict, check. And then again, if you are at extreme memorization phase, figure. Like if, if memorization is literally the only technique you use to learn anything, and again, there are not many of those people, but if you are one of them, then you may want to just randomly guess or skip it. So that you can spend the time on, on things that you're better at. But notice, how is the passage structured? That's asking you for an organizing principle. What does the author mean or intend that's meaning or intent? 
how does the first paragraph contrast with the second? That's an organizing principle. Because that's asking you, well, why is it in paragraphs the way that it's in paragraphs? What's, how, what's the best description of this that's intent or meaning? What, what's it there for? Um, this is intent or meaning again. So if it ever asks you, you know, what do they mean here, or why is it organized, or it's organized, or how is it organized? So this is a new question type, but it's not a new technique. Meaning, intent, or organizing principle. Still cover them up. Yeah. Check. So for the last passage, let's take a look at a question that does this. Just a second. Okay. Here's a question that does this. Can everybody see the question? There should be a question and there should be no choices. Um, if you if that is not what you have, then let me know in the text box. You should see somebody write UI. I do not know what that means. Um, okay, d d you, don't, you don't need to write yes. Um, if you do not see, if you do not see a passage, a question, and no answers, if you see anything other than that, tell me in the text box. If not, all good. Um, if I'm not sure what you mean by I can't see very well, if it means that it's small then you should probably make the window bigger. Um, the text will be sort of small. That's true. And there's not really a lot I can do about that. Because eliminate is the size that it is. But you may just want to make your window bigger. Um, there's, I'm not sure what you're asking, but the, yeah, the, the, the rectangles around the text boxes might be Let's just move that just a little. There, that might help. Okay. All right, here's a timer. I'll give you 30 seconds to predict. Come up with it. Actually, I'll give you 50 seconds to predict an answer to this. And then at the end of that 50 seconds, I'll show you the answer choices. But again, notice that this is another question about intent or meaning. What's the relationship? So you have to find this information this time. But it's still which one best characterizes it. Okay, there's your choices. Again, you should have the A through E options up there. Please indicate an A through E option. I'll give you about 30 to 45 seconds to do that. There's a timer. Remember, don't type in the text box, indicate what it means. Things. Okay. okay, everybody indicate an answer, please. Most of you have. If you need to guess, please guess. Five seconds. Okay. All right, so here's your results. Again, you mostly picked the correct answer, which indicates that this technique is working. It's a relationship question. Characterize the relationship. That means you do want to. It's a question about meaning. So you should be able to predict it. But you will have to look first before you predict. So 
the traditional model than Ryan's model. So if you go back to this, you can still use the transitions here. Some of these people, by contrast, have argued that the basic division is instead based on gender and that females are a class. And then it says Mary Ryan, for example. So th that's your relationship. Your relationship is going to be that she is an example of one of the people who thought it was based on sex instead of the traditional model. So the traditional model is not based on sex or gender. And Mary Ryan's model is. So you want a choice that is like that, which is this one. Prediction should be something like that. So Ryan's model is gender based. The traditional model isn't. And you can get that from those transition words that we were taught. We'll help you figure that out. So, B, B implies two things, neither of which is really in there, one of which is not in there. If you, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a sec. It, it, angry is a strong word. Um, B says they differ from Ryan in their assumption that that women are financially dependent on men. So these are pretty strong words. Like if if, if this actually means two things. This means, first of all, that the traditional models do assume that women are financially dependent. But if, if differ in this way means this is the difference. So B would mean that the traditional models said women are dependent on men, and Ryan's model said women are not dependent on men. And that's not true. Um, the, Ryan's model doesn't say that women are not dependent on men. Let me know if that makes sense. Okay. Um, C, D, and E were minority answers. One person each chose them, so I think we're pretty good with those. Any other questions? We'll move on to a different type of question. Okay. So let's take a look at something else. Here's a miniature passage. This is definitely not like a real reading hot passage, but still I'll get the point. Okay, there's your passage. Now what we're going to do is this. We're going to draw an inference. So now we're starting to look at inference question. First choice, if you've had me for class, which some of you haven't, you're already going to know what happens here. So most of you haven't had me for class. First, val first inference is this. Okay, um, let's make those A, B, and C. We'll put it one, two, and three. That'll be A. 
Now this is now this is okay. Give me choices. You still have your A through E's up there. Give me either A, B, or C. Give you about twenty seconds to do that. Please don't indicate in the text box, please. Um, I will tell you at least one of them is correct. So the answer is not needed. Um, please indicate using the the A through C buttons over here, not the text box. OK, we still have a couple people with no answer. We've got a Thacker, A. We've got a Severop, Rita, Raymond. Um, please pick answers. OK, here's the results. As we can see, we're pretty evenly split on this one. It turns out that it's actually just B. So it looks like there's going to be some learning happening here. The problem is, if you pick A, let me tell you what the issue is. Um, the, I've got good news and I've got bad news for you. Um, if you pick A, the good news is that you think like a normal real world human being. But the bad news is that you think like a normal real world human being. That's the good news and it's the bad news at the same time. Because the problem is, you know, that's what an inference means in the real world. In conversation, um, inference means that you observe, you, you basically make a series of observations and then try to guess things that might be true or that are probably true. based on those observations. OK, and that's what inference means in conversation. So for example, if I told somebody this, and I said, what would you infer? Yeah, they would probably say this. They would probably say Smith must really like seafood, and Smith is willing to pay quite a bit of money. The problem is that's not what it means on the GMAT. On the GMAT, inference means a statement that can be proved. This is a pretty big, fat difference here. Because that's not what it means in real life at, at all. But inference means you actually have to prove the statement. So you can prove the second statement because it says Smith has eaten 20 times. And so whoever said he might have had nothing, no, he might not because this says eaten. And then 19 means 19. 19 doesn't mean at least 19. So. Like if you say I have three cars, that means I have three. And it doesn't mean I might have four or five. It, it, three means three. Nineteen means nineteen. So there's no possibility that he ate seafood the twentieth time. So he's eaten seafood nineteen times out of twenty times that he's eaten and said the last time must have been non seafood. So you can prove that. Because you know, it's just, the proof is as trivial as 20 minus 19 is not zero. 
So there you go. You, it, it's a very boring statement. And also, like, it kind of misses the point. But there's two problems here. You actually can't, in statement one, you actually can't prove either of these things. You, you can't prove this, and you can't prove this either. So neither one of these things can be proved. So. In the first case, eating a food, eating a food most of the time doesn't mean you like it. It may be a health issue, it may be a religious issue, it may be that maybe that's all restaurant acts usually have, you know. Um, and also, premium would mean more than you pay for other foods. And we have no information about other foods. So, I mean, that's what the word premium is. It means more, he pays, Smith, he or she, pays more for the seafood than for other types of food. And that's not true. It may be true, it may be false. We just don't have any idea. It's a random wild guess. I mean, 40 per plate is a lot, but it's no page 50 per plate for other food than, than no. So, um, it's just B. So, some things to note, and it's really, really important about this. So, the first thing is that GMAT inferences would not be called inferences in real-world conversation. The second thing to note is that real-world inferences would not be recognized as valid on the internet. So it, it really kills the real-world brain in, in a couple of ways here. The other thing you want to notice is this. Um, Inferences are, are totally independent of the main point. In other words, they have nothing to do at all with those focus questions. In fact, sometimes the inferences seem to clash with the focus questions. Like if you look at this, if you had if you had to give a main idea for this passage, the main idea would totally be something like this guy eats a lot of seafood and pays a lot of money. Like if there were a main idea, that would be where it was. But the inference actually goes the other way. Like the inference is actually talking about not eating seafood, which is literally the complete obverse. It's the complete opposite of anything that you would ever specify as the main idea. So these are hard for this reason. In particular, for people who are very good at main ideas, these are hard. For people who are memorization, detail-based thinkers, these are much easier. Because actually, if you're an intuitive thinker, that will just get in the way of problems like these. So, um, that's also worth knowing. So, let's add a little bit of notes to this slide that we had over here. Um, if you are the pure memorization type, then those questions are going to be easier. Inference and strongly supported, which we'll talk about in a sec. Questions are easier if your learning type is over here. Here, main idea and or intent or organization. 
questions, the ones that are intuitive, are easier if your learning time is over here. So, like, this is one reason why, I mean, I know that I, I harp a lot on the idea of, of not putting too much stock in the idea of difficulty level. But especially on reading comp, difficulty levels are just totally meaningless because, like, they literally do not mean anything. Because if you learn like this, then you're going to find all main idea questions really hard, and you're going to find all independent organization questions really hard, regardless of what their so-called difficulty level is. But you're going to find the, the inference questions easy. If you're more of an intuitive thinker, then it's going to be exactly the other way around. If you're more of a main idea type thinker, you're going to find all the inference questions and support questions much harder. But you're going to find main ideas and support or an organization and intent type questions easier. So in the case of, I mean, you should never emphasize difficulty level when you study, but when it comes to reading comp, you can just completely ignore it. It's just a meaningless thing. And honestly, reading comps are not very adaptive anyway. Like, unlike the other types of reading comps, most people will get mostly the same questions when they do these anyway. So it's, it's just, you should think of it as just a slew of question types that you have to master without worrying about how they are. Smiling face, if that all makes sense, and you're ready to try one. Okay. So here it is. And this one, you're not going to cover up the, the choices, but you do have to prove the state. So there's the question. Okay, I'm going to clear out your answers. I'll give you about a minute and 45 or so, maybe a minute and a half. Again, please indicate your answers in the with those with those letter buttons up there, not in the text box. Thank you. You guys should be able to move the timer around yourselves, actually. Here's another 30 seconds if you can. But the timer, you, you should actually be able to move the timer. Okay, um, this question people generally tend to find hard, but try to give me an answer to it. Okay, most of you have answers, let's talk about it. The first thing you want to do is properly locate the stuff that we're talking about. If you pick A, then you didn't find the you were not looking at the right stuff. Um, the most recent research is not Mary Ryan. It's this one. So the problem with A is that A is in the wrong place. A, A is legal status is up here. And the only way that, this is the only place in this passage that anybody ever talks about legal status. So A is wrong because the most recent analysis, as far as we know, doesn't, doesn't talk about legal status at all. Smiley face if that makes sense. Okay. Um, C is also not the point. If you look at um, if you look at this statement, it just says examining ways in which the condition of working class women differs from that of middle class women as well as from that of working class men. So there's no, the problem with C is, is these words more than. You can't 
prove that because it doesn't prioritize one of these over the other. It just says both of them matter. Like working class differs from middle class, meaning that wealth matters. But they differ from men in their own class, which means that gender also matters. So, but it doesn't prioritize one over the other. So the more than is fatal to this, to this choice. Smiley face, if that makes sense. If you have questions, please type them. Okay. Um, middle class bias. There's no middle class bias here. Um, it, it does say that there was a middle class ideal that some women were excluded from. But it doesn't talk about a middle class bias. In, in fact, earlier feminist models would be these ones with Mary Ryan. And those actually talk about middle class and working class being identical. So there's no bias either way. And the other problem with B is that it just doesn't say this. Um, th there's nowhere in here where it says middle class bias. Um, people were pretty all over the place on this question. So again, it's kind of hard. Um, people, the answers people pick were B. So you did, majority of you did pick it correctly, which is D. Um, again, choice A says legal status. So choice A is dead. I mean, you, you don't really need to look at it any, any longer than that because it says legal status. And legal status is not in here at all. So anything beyond that, you pretty much just don't have to look at. Um, we're down to D versus E. The problem with D, with the problem with E is that it's not really true. Um, because if you look at what happens here, basically the traditional models were economic only. Ryan's model and the earlier feminist models were gender only. So these were economic only, these were gender only, these were both. So they've questioned both of the models. The first way, they, they diverge from Ryan's model because they consider economics and they diverge from the traditional models because they consider gender. So the problem with choice E is that they, they don't challenge the economic definition. What they're challenging is the fact that they, they don't include gender. But they're actually using the economic definitions in the same sort of way that the traditional models do. So as far as the people asking about legal status, you, you can't infer anything. I mean, remember what we said about these questions. You have to prove it. So you can't prove that Anne Oakley says that legal status doesn't matter because the paragraph doesn't say anything at all about how Anne Oakley feels about legal status. Like, it's, it's just not addressed. So if somebody, like, if they just don't say something, you can't assume the opposite. It's just it's just left up in the air. Like in our example about Smith and the seafood, you can't assume that Smith likes or doesn't like seafood. It's just not you don't know. So D is the correct answer because they pointed out the difference in class and they pointed out the difference in gender. And this model didn't point out the gender difference, and this model over here didn't point out the class. This is one of the harder questions that they'll give you, but 
notice that you can prove D. Remedy these things means to fix them. Perceived inadequacies, things that they thought had to be considered that had not been considered. So fix perceived errors is basically what that means. Any other questions about this problem that we haven't hit? Yeah. Okay, here's what we're going to do because we're starting to push up against the time limit. I want to discuss the I want to discuss two more question types just to make sure we have a full treatment. Although we're not going to see examples of them today because we would have to we would have to hit another passage entirely, which we don't have time to do. But let's take notes on a couple of different question types that you'll see. Two more question types. Okay, but first let's review what we said about inferences. Inference questions, there's a couple ways you might see this. Which of these can be inferred or logically inferred? Yeah, it was D. D like dog. Um, you might also see if the statements in the passage are true, which of the following must also be true. These are the ones we just saw, but the deal is here you ignore, um, you don't worry about main points and stuff, but you just pick the statement that must be true or can be proved. Even if it's a very mundane statement, you need to ignore the real world conversational meaning of inference because it just doesn't apply yet. So that's how inference questions work. New question type, again we're not going to see examples of it here, but I'll give you a start. Um, suggested or supported. It might say strongly, it might not, it doesn't really so much matter, it's really the same type of thing. Um, if they give you a question that asks you for what is most strongly suggested or supported, so like which of the following statements is most strongly supported? or the statement of the passage suggest which of the following. Again, there's a contrast here with real life. In real life, suggestion is any sort of vague hint of anything. But on the GMAT, it's, it's not. It's still a very strong statement. Um, in this case, it's slightly less rigorous than the inference. Okay, the inference is basically 100% sure. The difference here is you're like 99.99% .99 sure. So pick the statement that is true beyond any reasonable objection. So in other words, you can say that you're like 99.99% true. Um, but again, you're still ignoring real world meanings here. Because I mean, suggest could mean like the slightest, vaguest thing in the real world. So let me give you an example of this with another mini passage. Let's say. Rob walked past a bowl containing a thoroughly mixed collection of red and green candies, 50 of each. As he walked past, Rob grabbed 
25 red candies. And no green ones. Okay, an example of an inference on this thing, because remember an inference has to be something that you can prove true. So an inference here would be something like after Rob grabbed the candy. The ratio of green to red candies was two to one. So, like you guys can see, smiley face, you see that that has to be true. Like there, there are no objections to that at all. You can actually mathematically prove that. So, smiley face, if you see that again, this is not what inference means. It's the real people. Like, the real people, if I said, give me an inference, would be like, oh, Rob really likes the red ones. But that's not what you do here. An example of a strongly supported statement would be something more like this. So this statement, again, you can't 100% prove this, but the only objections to this statement are totally absurd. Because, like, if you were going to object to this, you would have to say something like, well, maybe Rob grabbed 25 reds and no greens completely at random and just happened to grab 25 of the same thing. But you should be able to see that that's just not reasonable. So you can't prove this statement true, but the, the only objections to this are just ridiculous. Smiley face if that makes sense. OK, and then an example of a statement that's going to be a wrong answer just about everything even though people will think it. Would be something like this. If you say Rob likes the red man. Well, we, we don't know that. I mean, there's plenty of reasonable objections to that one. I mean, he might, green ones, you know, he, he might be picking them for some reason other than the way he likes them. He might be picking them for someone else. There's lots of reasonable objections to this. Um, an example, I mean, whereas the only way you could, the only way that this one could be not true is, is just totally fucked up. So that's how that works. Um, that's pretty much the question types we're going to talk about today. The one major question type we didn't get to today is basically this. If it says, the question says, according to the passage, or it says this. Um, then what you're doing is you just need to find things that are actually stated in the passage. So we're not doing any examples of those because it's basically just go find the information. That doesn't mean they're going to be easy. I mean, they're, they're heavily detail-oriented and nitpicky, which makes them hard for some people. But they're not, you know, it's really just can you find this or can you not find it. So that's what these are. But these are the two that give people the most issues because they're they're just obnoxious and they're not like the way people think in the real world. So, okay, we are over on time. Um, Dinesh, I don't, you said, please explain this. I need to know what you didn't get about the explanation that I gave at first because... I need to know how. Um, I 
Yeah, I'm not sure what it was. Like, you have to ask me a question. Um, I'm not sure. Um, well, let me rephrase that. It's, it's the way I... Okay, it's not that he didn't grab them. It's, it's Rob's way of selecting and was not grabbed. So that that might help you. Um, so yeah. Um, let's see. Question. Well, okay. Ronald says it's it's. I mean, I wouldn't call it might be true because, I mean, unless you're thinking like like a purely mathematical robot here. You, you don't, you wouldn't call this by, I mean, this is basically certain. It's not something you can prove using cold logic, but the only ways the, that this statement could not be true are just beyond ridiculous. So, I mean, it, it's going to depend on which one of these students that you are. Um, if you are a very memorization-based student, then there's going to be a huge difference between these two. If you're an intuitive student, there will be literally no difference at all. They, they will be exactly the same. Um, but this is a statement that just, there's no reasonable way for this to be false. Um, like if you, uh, the people who are typing about you have to be like a robot, sort of. On main idea questions, if you're a robot, you'll get them all wrong. On these kinds of questions, if you're a robot, you're good. Um, another example of a strongly supported statement, you know, like every human in history has been under nine feet tall. So if I have a kid, the kid will be, you know, under a hundred feet tall. Also very strongly supported. I mean, it doesn't logically have to be true, but there's basically no reasonable way it could be false. So, um, but it's not a logical proof. These are logical proofs. These are just, wow, this, this has to be true because all the false possibilities are just stupid. So, um, no, it'll be in the question. Like, if you see a question that says, this, that is an inference. And if you see a question, we didn't get to this passage, but okay, no, 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 these, these words will be in the question. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.